Welcome to Pivot to First. I'm Mike Seidel, and every day as CTO at Pivot CX, I get to work with some of the most brilliant people in the industry with one goal, turning hiring into a competitive advantage. Today's guest is Tracy Chernoff, host of one of the most interesting HR-focused podcasts out there, bringing the human back to human resources. Tracy's been an HR manager, trainer, director of HR, and is now director of employee engagement for Legion Technologies. I think we met about a year ago when you had me on as a guest on your podcast, Tracy. Welcome. Thank you so much. I can't believe it's already been basically a year. It has been, hasn't it? So first question, um, I got to ask you this. Where did we all go wrong? Um, it seems like in HR, we drove all the humans out of the day-to-day -day practice <laughs> and replaced them all with, uh, I don't know, technology or something. How did, I know, how something did we get to like where that. We are? Yeah, it's a great question. And actually, I have to think about this sometimes myself, like, why are we bringing the human back? Why is that the name of my podcast? But actually, someone recently asked me a very similar question, which I kind of shared, like, there's a reason why I'm not saying putting the human back into human resources or putting the human into human resources, because it was already there. We just kind of lost our way a little bit. So I'm bringing us back. And I think where we lost our way was really through the age of technology, streamlining, efficiency, operational efficiency, labor operations, um, and, and labor efficiency, optimization, and all of those keywords that we've heard used like a million times, just like I use them, throwing them out there. But really, I, I think that it's a good thing that we've optimized, that we've focused on efficiency and innovation and technology. I'm in technology. I love it. I breathe it. I live it. But there is this uh, opportunity to really bring people and technology and businesses back together. And you know from even being on my show, that is the name of the game because it's not an all or nothing. It's not this or that or one or the other. It can all happen at the same time. And so I think where we went wrong is just potentially just forgetting that piece that while we optimize and focus on efficiency, we should also focus on the people that make that happen. Well, I think I think one of the things that's really easy to forget as a as a operator, as a C-level executive, um, a lot of times is that um, there, there are two parts of your business that are just inherently relationship driven. One is employment and the other is sales. And it's so funny how many uh, companies get the sales and marketing thing right, and they totally get the HR part of it wrong and, and uh, end up in a, a really bad place because of it. How, how do you avoid that? How do you, how do you really approach employment and, and hiring with a, a, a really relationship driven, hey, I'm, I'm really working with humans here kind of attitude? I think it starts with the people who are in those hiring managing hiring hiring manager positions I should say and when I when I say that I really mean that when you have a group of people whether they're C suite or executive level director level who are really focused on creating a specific culture or creating a specific product to solve a problem when you have like-minded people around the table or on Zoom, for example, you can create a lot from that like-mindedness. And so if you bring people that are thought leaders or maybe with differing levels of emotional intelligence, because not everyone needs to have high emotional intelligence to be successful. It's just a matter of the role that you're in, right? So when you bring people together who have those goals, initiatives, focuses on just giving people a good experience. You don't have to be an empath. You don't have to be an HR person. You just have to really commit to this idea that you want to be a great place to work, a great employer to work for. And you start to create programs and initiatives around that. And actually, I do a lot of um, dis or have a lot of discussions around how happy employees create and drive happy customer experiences. So when you, you know, you might, someone listening might say, I don't care about people. I don't want to focus on people. I want to focus on my bottom line. And that's okay. I'm not here to tell you that people have to be your number one priority. But what I can tell you is, is that when you make people your number one priority, you don't have to focus so much on the business. Everything kind of falls into place where it needs to fall. And I've seen this firsthand, you know, growing up in my in my retail career, but in my HR career specifically, where there are a lot of metrics tied to HR professionals that they don't have a ton of control over. And salespeople probably feel similarly in that on one hand, you have all of this control in your pitch, in understanding the product, what it is that you're working on and doing. But then you have zero control in how 
the customer or the potential customer will react, even if you do all of those things right. But what I can tell you is that I have seen and I've experienced this firsthand that when you focus on building that happy employee experience and and focus on giving them an environment that allows them to be more productive, to want to know the product better, to want to make the customer experience amazing, then that's where you don't have to think about your bottom line anymore because it just unfolds for you in a positive way and and your business is driven somewhat more passively. And, and that's to me like the magic sauce. So, um, you know, I, I think that the if we can all walk away bringing these like-minded, you know, thought leaders together and agreeing that, you know, regardless of what our reasoning is, what our why is, that if we focus on happy employees and, and then we'll have productive employees. Yeah, I think that's a, a really important point. Happy employees are productive. And, and in today's, you know, I mean, we're post COVID and, and all that, but we're still in this, this job market where people can leave really quickly. And so uh, the other thing that's really important about mm -hmm. happy employees is they happen to be more likely to stay. So, um, really? you know, it, it's really interesting. I think the last three guests I've had on this podcast have all spent a lot of time talking about engagement and how important it is. And, and what it comes down to is, uh, you know, an engaged workforce is going to do a better job. They're going to be happier and they're going to stay. Um, they're more likely to stay than they are to churn. So, um, mm -hmm. So important. So a lot of companies have spent a lot of money on automation, Every, everything from, you know, at the top of the recruiting funnel, uh, automating screening to outsourcing, communicating with candidates to chatbots to, you know, one click onboarding to um, even, uh, you know, you start looking at reviews and ratings of, of your employee and how you how you're uh, rewarding your employees and promoting them and, and that sort of thing. Um, we've invested all so much in automating. What, what, what areas do we get automation right in the HR world? Well, I have to tell you, I work for a company that gets automation right. So I'm, as you mentioned, I'm the director of employee engagement at Legion Technologies. And the reason why I'm here is actually because I brought Legion on when I was working at a retailer. So I came from like the customer experience and I was like, oh man, I love this tool. I love this company. I, I want to join them. So anyway, I digress. Really what we do is we are an AI powered workforce management company. Our mission is to turn hourly jobs into good jobs. And a fact that you might not know is that 58% of working and eligible working Americans are hourly. So 58% of Americans who are eligible to work are earning their income on an hourly basis. And we already know the vulnerability based on pay and hours worked and whether they're part-time, full-time, benefits eligible, et cetera. And what I really truly believe we are doing right at Legion is that we have a mission that's so tangible. We want to turn hourly jobs, the majority of Americans working experience into good jobs. And, you know, one of the things that we um, that I talk about a lot in my role, really being able to face externally for future customers, because I came from that side before joining Legion internally, but also what I share with our internal employees is that, you know, engagement is not just about pay and benefits. And you can go on Forbes, you can go on LinkedIn, you could go ask your neighbor. Everyone's saying, if you pay people right and you give them good benefits, they'll stay forever. And that is wrong. It's not true. People want more than that. It's why we still are having difficulty retaining teams, right, as, as employers. And so everyone's trying to solve this problem. How can we, what, are, what can we do? How can we do it? And what we say at Legion is like, there's this third pillar. Actually, there are four, four pillars. It's pay and benefits, sure. Those are two pillars. But the third is that employees employees, people want flexibility and predictability. And four, I should say four, not three, four is that employees oh, wait, wait want flexibility, yeah. flexibility, and predictability. predictability. Those, those I would say that those are the same thing. Not exactly. Okay. I can break this down. So people want good pay, good benefits, flexibility, predictability. And then the fourth is that they want to feel connected to the bigger picture. So it's like the culture, right? It's the communication. So when we think about the tools that are doing this well, and I can specifically talk about what we're doing at Legion, it's that thinking about flexibility and predictability, 
And it's totally makes sense that you're like, wait a second, aren't those opposites? They're not because all this means is that employees want the opportunity to decide what their lives look like. So they want to have some predictability. They want to know, okay, if I'm getting hired to work 40 hours a week, I want to know that I'm getting that 40 hours a week. But they want the flexibility to determine what that 40 hours looks like. So maybe they want to swap a shift on a Monday to a Tuesday because they are going away for the weekend. Or maybe they don't want to work in the morning and they'd prefer to work at night and vice versa. So flexibility and predictability work hand in hand when you have an AI powered workforce management tool in this case. And then that fourth pillar in terms of communications and really again, answering your question around like the automation that is getting it right, when employees feel connected to the bigger picture through communication, then that's where they are not just like these amoebas that represent the company, but are floating around in like, you know, in the universe without a, a real like connection and tether to the purpose and the mission of the organization. And I say that because I, one, I've worked hourly jobs in retail and other industries before, but two, because most of my HR career has been in retail. And I've seen this feeling of like the employee just kind of floating around and not really feeling grounded. And so at Legion, another thing that we're focusing on is frontline communications, because when, again, when you think about this 58% of our, of Americans being hourly, that 58% of people also on the majority do not have a communication tool that connects them to the bigger picture. Like if you, I worked at Target in the early days of my HR career and I was salaried. I had an email, I had a computer. It was easy, right? Even my cell phone was connected to the Target applications, but a sales associate who was working part-time or full-time had absolutely no connection. So those are, I would say that we are, we are definitely getting it right. So Let's talk a little bit about recruiting and, and the beginning of these relationships. You know, the, the question really, uh, you know, for us at Pivot CX, we've really focused on kind of um, mid funnel. It's it's more of a not what happens right when right when somebody's applying for a job, but what happens after they apply. And I think a lot of companies really get recruiting wrong and start relationships off on the wrong foot with their candidates. I think I think a lot of companies are busy. Um, almost processing candidates like they're chicken instead of building a relationship with somebody that, that could come in and be one of these uh, employees that really is connected and, and engaged and, and honestly happy. Um, what, what do companies get wrong uh, before someone's an employee? Well, I think in some cases, companies are not really clear on who they are. And so they're pitching this blue sky, amazing experience. And we've all been there. I've done it. I've definitely done it because it's what I wanted to experience. So I was like, maybe the candidate, like, hey, you know, it's a little messy right now. We've got a lot of work to do, but this is where we're going. This is what we want to achieve. And this is what we're looking to, you know, bring on as far as like characteristics, qualities, experiences, et cetera. So I think that's one thing is Sometimes you just have to be super transparent about where you are today and what you want your future state to look like. And then the second thing is that I think sometimes companies are or organizations, hiring managers, whoever we want to, you know, assign to this challenge, we are not necessarily hiring for diversity of thought. And now obviously diversity, equity, inclusion, that's one huge subject, which we don't even have time to talk about today, but obviously very important. But when I say diversity of thought, I actually mean hiring people that are different from you, who think differently from you, who have different priorities than you. Like I, for example, I'm super outgoing, very autonomous. I don't really want anyone telling me what to do unless it's like an actual objective. And I like to just be told what the objective is and then like you know, to be able to run with it unless there are certain parameters. But hiring someone exactly like me might not be the most effective thing for my team, right? I might need to hire someone who wants a little bit more direction, or I might, depending on the role that I'm hiring for, I might hire someone who is super autonomous because maybe my bandwidth doesn't allow me to really give as much direction as someone might need. So I think sometimes we forget that we are all human beings and we have our wants and needs and and preferences, but then other people have those then and they might be similar or dissimilar to ours. And actually, I find that when you bring people onto a team that 
represent and present different ways of thinking and different priorities. It makes for a more comprehensive team environment, but also your ideas are challenged. You have more growth opportunities and you grow as individuals a lot more too when you're challenged in the way that you think. So I, I think that we probably write off a lot of candidates just because they don't present the way we want them to present. And that's okay. They're human beings. It's just a matter of what fits for the role in the team. Well, you know, Tracy, one thing I've, I've seen over and over in my career is at when you interview someone, um, especially when you're the hiring manager and that candidate knows for sure that if they can convince me they're getting the job, um, it, it, it's really hard because the candidate is not good at uh, getting jobs. They don't do that very often, really. Even mm -hmm. if they, even if they are a quote a job hopper, they're only doing an interview. You know, maybe a, they're only interviewing a couple weeks out of the year. If yeah. there's somebody that that's been a really great employee somewhere for a long time, um, you may catch them and they haven't interviewed in ten years. Right. And so you have this person in front of you that is scared out of their mind and. They know they're different than me and they know that if they can make if they can make the sale to me, they get the job. And, and so it really leads to a really uncomfortable uh, situation, especially for the candidate. And I think we all forget mm -hmm. that. Um, and, and hiring managers yeah. a lot of times don't get the kind of training that a corporate recruiter would on how to do just a stock screening interview. And so they, they get right. in there and um, they ask questions that end up. Um, literally screening people out because they, they are uh, a little bit different and not because they're going to be good or bad at the job, but just because they, they don't meet, um, you know, whatever, whatever that hiring manager was thinking makes them just like me. Totally. Totally. You know, what, something that I thought about as you were mentioning that, because I think it's a really important point, is that there is a reason why there are so many people, inc myself included, who are talking about how to write a good resume or actually editing resumes. There's a reason why we're talking about interview, you know, presentations and, and how you lead yourself in an interview and carry yourself. It's because not everyone has experience with this. And actually, depending on your upbringing, you might not even have access to learning these things. So, you know, when we think about what we're expecting from candidates, yeah, I think that there is a bit of an imbalance in like the expectation and what's reasonable, reasonable to expect from someone. It's not to say that we should just totally flush the format and, you know, bring anyone on, even if they don't pass our interviews. That's definitely not what I'm saying. But I think that there is a way that we can think about candidates a little bit differently and actually bring a bit more humanity to the interview process. Like even when we think about the amount of time and the amount of interviews we're putting someone through. I've been, I remember vividly, I, I'm like, I have like a little bit of a, you know, a trigger in my mind from this, but I remember vividly going through an interview process with a company that I ended up not moving forward with for a specific reason, but they came to me, put me through seven interviews, said that they were no longer um, hiring for the role. They come back to me, they're like, oh, you know, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> It's so crazy, so right? seven seven interviews later, they finally get back to you and say they're not hiring you. Yeah, they're like, and we love was, you, but we're not hiring anymore. Wow. Um, what, was this something that um, they could have figured out a lot earlier in the process? Oh, I don't, I, as someone who has created positions and has been a hiring manager, they probably knew it before they interviewed me. And if they didn't, then they clearly had a lot of organizing to do. And this was like not a startup, you know, this was like an established organization. So I was like, oh, maybe it's a good thing that they're not hiring. Maybe it's a good thing that I'm not getting this job. But then, you know, maybe the joke is on me because they came back to me and they said, hey, we're hiring for a different type of role. Why don't you interview? We'd love to interview for it. But it was in a different spot in the organization, different department. And I went through five more interviews and then they were like, you know what, we're changing changing around our uh, organizational structure again. And I honestly, I'm sure for listeners, they're gonna be like, yeah, I don't believe that. I don't think she's telling a single truth in that statement, but I'm telling you, 
that you cannot make this stuff up. But I share this example because for me, and that was like a director level. I mean, this is, I, I know that organizations change structures and, and uh, you know, whatever the idea is behind what the future of the organization looks like, those things change all the time. But we have to remember that we are interviewing human beings and human beings have lives. They have jobs most of the time when they're interviewing, they're putting a lot of sacrifice into spending time with the organization. So I think there are some ways that we can probably streamline processes or just make conversations much more efficient. So when you are having a conversation, it's not just like, tell me a little bit about yourself. Why do you want this job? Ask some more hard hitting questions so you can really get to the root of who that person is and what they're bringing to the table so that, you know, 15 or 13 interviews later, you're not telling them twice <laughs> that the, the, the positions are canceled, you know? Oh, absolutely. Uh, that, that kind of brings up a, a, thing that we run into a lot um, as we onboard our customers at Pivot CX, our, our focus, you know, really is we plug into applicant tracking systems and we plug into job boards and make it so when somebody applies for a job, they can have a conversation with a real human being uh, mm -hmm. almost immediately. And one of the things that we've we've really been doing more and more of as we we uh, we grow is is getting more of the screening and assessment work done before we get to interviews so that the interviewers aren't stuck with kind of a, a candidate that they know nothing about other than a resume. Right. And um, so that these hiring managers actually have something to go by and go, okay, well, it looks like, you know, if I'm hiring a software developer, we've got some scores from coding tests to look at and we, we, we have a resume and we have, um, you know, a little more information about that person than they, they would usually have. And that seems to really help a lot in that the, the hiring managers, when they engage, aren't going to spend all their time on the basics and then end up having to do two, three sessions to get down to business um, yeah. to figure out where they really want to hire that person. So we, we've really seen, um, you know, that, that these processes are really best when, when they're they're human driven and, and you can't get people to take those kind of assessments and that kind of thing unless you're talking. Um, and I yeah. think that's a really important piece of this whole thing. Your, your conversation with an, an employee begins, I think, you know, right after they apply. Yeah, I agree. And I, I mean, it's why I had you on my podcast because I really think it's very interesting what you and the Pivot CX team are, are doing to really challenge the status quo. And, you know, I think two things on this point too, there is no greater value than getting a peer assessment from an interview. Like I can think about times where I have interviewed for jobs just to kind of, you know, get my name out there and taking a call or whatever. And I've not spoken with a potential peer and there's such a different understanding of the experience. And then I also think about times where I was the peer interviewing and I was like, oh, you know, I don't know about this person, red flag all over the place. But my boss was like, this person's great. And, you know, when you think about the value of bringing a peer in, not only are you giving them something beyond their role, so you're investing in their growth and their development, and you're, you're showing them, not just telling them, but you're showing them that you value their opinion and their thoughts, you're getting, you're getting so much value out of bringing what that potential peer um, would experience into that conversation. So that's one free way to maximize the conversations and the interpersonal part of the interviews. But the second thing too, is that when we think about, you know, the way that we interview now, it used, everything used to be in person. So now we're doing everything like this, you know, not, I, I don't even remember the last time I interviewed yeah. someone in person. So how you have to almost develop a new skill and you have to question yourself if you've, you know, met with someone who is amazing. Are you asking the right questions? Have they gotten good at, at interviewing? Or like, you know, we know that they've screened to your point with your clients, they've already been screened. So we know that, you know, they're coming ready, ready with the right qualifications that you need for the role. So now ask those questions that, that maybe are a little bit more challenging and get, again, I really think this is so invaluable. Get someone who will be their peer or a stakeholder for that, that role, get them in on the interview process because it just like, it helps them. It helps like the actual active current employee. And it also for the candidate, it's a wonderful experience because they can ask that potential peer questions they're probably not asking you. And so it creates a really nice experience. 
I, I can tell you from experience that having those peer interviews makes a huge difference. We actually right? do that at Pivot CX when we hire. And um, we're, we're a small company, you know, we're, we're a startup where every hire I make is, you know, I think at this point, the next hire we make will be 7% of our culture. Um, that, you know, wow. that person is literally that, that important just because we're that yeah. small. And so every hire you make when you're small is really important. And as a, um, you know, as a business owner, I can sit here and go, um, you know, I'll interview them and I, I know best, but the truth is that how a new employee interacts with their teammates, how, how they're going to fit into that team is absolutely critical. And yeah. I am probably the worst person in my company to judge how well a candidate's going to fit their peers are the ones that yes. they have to fit in with. And the peers are the ones that need to, to be able to tell me that and they need to be able to tell me without fear. So if somebody has an interview, like you described where it's like, Oh no, not that guy. Uh, I need yeah. to realize, even if I think that person is the, the great, you know, I, I think I've got a, the, the perfect candidate here. If my people are telling me, no, uh, maybe the right answer is no. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. I mean, you think about why people stay. It's yes, they, of course, people stay because they have, you know, a good relationship with their boss. Maybe they have all of those other things we talked about, pay benefits, flexibility, predictability and communication or, or connection, I should say. But the other thing is that that experience, that connection, so much of that is fueled by the people that you're working around. And I mean, we see it all the time in employee surveys and it's like, oh, I love my peers. They're all smart, but I, you know, I, I, I wish this or I wish that. And the reason why people are really staying, even when you see manager turnover, is because they just like really love their friends that they've made at work. Even virtually, I mean, we're seeing now with, with Gen Z, they want to be in the office a lot of the time because they want to create relationships. They also want to be remote because they want this flexibility in their lives. So if we know that 50% of it is employer controlled and that like the way that we expect people to work and the other 50% is who we actually have working, then our intention and the way that we put our energy into listening to the feedback of those peers who are involved in the conversation and the interviews, that is to your point, having the safety and really the psychological safety to say, hey, I really don't think this person is the one. That is only going to make that bond and that glue so much stronger. And, and it's going, like if I were the employee on your team, saying, I don't know about this person. And you said to me, all right, maybe not the right person. I'd be like, wow, my voice was heard. I, I'm, I'm valued. I, I, you know, I matter. Like there are so many intrinsic benefits just in listening and, and really, you know, appreciating feedback. I think listening is one of the most underappreciated skills that there is. Um, mm. it, it's something that I think a lot of people could do well to learn better. You know, when, mm -hmm. when it comes to um, actually acknowledging an employee and actually um, valuing them, one of the biggest things you can do is valuing their input. And that's why it's 100%. just so important. If you're going to have a peer interview, you better respect the outcome from the peer interview. <laughs> I mean, if, if that employee says don't do it, don't do it. Uh, right. So uh, we're, we're coming up here on, on about 30 minutes. And so let's, let's go ahead and kind of wrap things up a little bit. So Tracy, thank you so much for being with me. Um, Tracy has a great podcast. It's at hrtracy.com. And that Tracy is spelled with an I. Um, a few quick questions on your way out the door. Um, first off, uh, what book that you read has really changed your life? Does it have to be like a self-help business book or can it be like any book? can be anything. I mean, I mean, what, what's made a difference to you personally? What's the thing you've read? It could be fiction. It could be nonfiction. It could be self-help. Um, okay. honestly, the best ones are the ones that are usually not self-help. Yeah. I'm not much of a self-help reader, but for my podcast, I've had to really break down that, that barrier because, you know, a lot of my guests have books and they're actually quite good. So it's, it's broadened my horizons, which is good, but two books that come to mind. One, the cat, I can also have something to know about me. I can never pick just one thing. Um, one, the catcher in the rye and two, the nightingale. So the nightingale is probably my absolute favorite book. It's a, uh, historical fiction novel set in France during world war II. I am Jewish. So I connect a lot with that timeline. And so that book for me, just like, I don't know what it did. It just like totally 
awoke, awakened my spirit and my soul. And I just absolutely love it. And that is by Kristen Hanna. Um, highly recommend actually every book she writes is like gold to me. Um, but then The Catcher in the Rye, which we all probably know that reading that in high school, I've read it a million times over since then reading that in high school really allowed me to almost like find my own power if that makes sense i've always been very headstrong very determined but realizing that like it's a little bit it, it's okay to be on your own or to be who you are and to not apologize for that even though there's obviously there are a lot more takeaways from that book and a lot of things that we can theorize um but my my takeaway from reading that is that it's totally okay to be exactly who you are Okay. Favorite saying. Favorite saying. Um, hmm. Oh, gosh. I don't know. Uh, oh, I, I've got it. I, I know, right? I was speechless there for a moment. I got it. And I say this all the time. Every problem has a solution. All right. And then last, last question. Uh, favorite movie. Oh gosh. Um, I'm really bad at picking favorites. Like if you can't tell already. Um, all right. Top hmm. five without the bottom four. Okay. Okay. <laughs> That's funny. Wait, now I'm even more stressed out. Um, favorite movie. You know, I'm just going to go with Harry Potter series because I was privileged to grow up before the movies came out. So I was able to read all of the books and then, you know, watch the movie. It was, it was a wonderful time to be alive reading the books before the movies came out. So Harry Potter. <laughs> okay. And then is there anything you'd like to share with our audience? I just appreciate you listening to all of the things that make me so excited and passionate like HR, which not everyone can say that they're so excited and passionate about this, but I do appreciate your time as well, Mike, and, and that you brought me on your podcast. And I'm just so glad that we can continue to talk about why bringing the human back to business, regardless whether it's HR or not, that that is a wonderful mission to be on. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, thank you again, Tracy Chernoff.